you know, not sponsored or anything, but these things, oh, sorry, upside down for you. These things, and I mean any, any brand, I've got a different brand right here, but these are pretty awesome. They're OBD2 readers in the form of wireless or Bluetooth or things like that. And what they do is they allow you to take your phone and connect it to your car to be able to see what is happening with it. Um, be able to see how much it is using fuel wise, uh, how it is running, um, how much, what the oil is doing, what all the components are doing, what is populating when you have like a check engine light or things like that post up. Um, it, it's pretty cool to kind of see all that information and be able to then give it to your mechanic when you go see them. Again, not sponsored, uh, but I use a program called the Dash Command and it's, it's pretty fun what all you can see with it and what all you can kind of look at and, and be able to do with it. And it's, it's a free app unless um, you need some of the extras for your vehicle and then it costs depending on what your vehicle is. But anyway, you guys wanted to hear Borrowers of Field. And what we were on today is actually is chapter 10. So let's go ahead here and jump right in if you guys would hopefully, you guys have, but grab your copies of the book, like, share, and subscribe. Let's go ahead here and jump right in to chapter 10. They slept well and woke next morning bright and early. The sun poured slantwise into the alcove and when Pod had unlaced it into the neck of the boot, for breakfast, Arietti gathered six wild strawberries and homily broke up some wheat grains with Pod's small bell clapper, which sprinkled with water, they ate as cereal. And if you're still hungry, Arietti, remarked homily, you can get yourself a nut. The program for the day was arranged as follows. Pod, in view of last night's happening, was to make a solitary expedition across the field to the island of the trees in the center in one last bid to find the badger set. Homily, because of her fear of open spaces, would have to stay behind, and Arietti, Pod said, must keep her company. There's plenty of jobs about the house, he told them. To start with, you can weatherproof one of the borrowing bags, rub it all over hard with a bit of candle, and it'll do for cartering water. Then, when you take the fret saw and saw off a few hazelnuts for drinking out of, and while you're about it, you can gather a few extra nuts and store them in the annex, seeing as we don't have a spade. There's a nice bit of horsehair I saw in the hedge going toward the stile, caught on a bramble bush. You can fetch a bit of that along if you feel like it, and I'll see about making a fishnet, and a bit more corn crushing wouldn't come amiss. Oh, come on, Pod, protested Homily. Oblige you, we'd like to, but we're not slaves. Well said Pod, gazing thoughtfully across the ocean of Tuscany grass. It'll take me pretty near all day getting there, searching round and getting back. I don't want you fretting. I knew it would end like this, said Homily later in a depressed voice, as she and Arietti were waxing the borrowing bag. What did I tell you always, back home when you wanted to emigrate? Didn't I tell you just how it would be, drafts? moths, worms, snakes, and whatnot. And you saw how it was when it rained. What's it going to be like in the winter? You tell me that. No one can say, I'm not trying, she went on. And no one won't hear a word of grumble past my lips. But you mark my words, Arietti. We won't none of us see another spring. And a round tear fell on the wax cloth and rolled away 
like a marble. What with the rat catcher, Arietti pointed out, we wouldn't have if we stayed back home. And I wouldn't be surprised, Homley persisted, if that boy wasn't right. Remember what he said about the end of the race? Our time has come, I shouldn't wonder. If you ask me, we're dying out. But she cheered up a bit when they took the bag down to the water to fill it up with a silver of soap to wash with. The drowsy heat and the gentle stir of ripples past their landing stage of bark seemed always to calm her, and she even encouraged Arietti to have a bath and let her splash about a little in the shallows. For being so light, the water was incredibly buoyant, and it would not be very long, Arietti felt, before she would learn to swim. Where she had used the soap, the water went cloudy and softly translucent to the shifting colors of moonstones. After her bath, Arietti felt refreshed and left Homily in the annex to get the tea and went on up the hedge to collect the horsehair. Not that there was anything to get, Homily thought irritably, setting out a few hips and haws and some watercress and crackling a couple of nuts with the bell clapper. The horsehair caught on a bramble was halfway up the hedge, but Arietti, refreshed by her dip, was glad of the chance to climb. On the way down, seeking a foothold, she let out a tiny scream. Her toes had touched not the cool bark, but something soft and warm. She hung there, grasping the horsehair and staring through the leaves. All was still, nothing but tangled branches. Fleckled with sunlight after a second or two, in which she hardly dared to breathe. A flicker of movement caught her eyes as though the tip of the branch had swayed. Staring, she saw, like a bunch of budding twigs, the shape of a brownish hand. It could not be a hand, of course, she told herself, but that's what it looked like. With tiny, calloused fingers no larger than her own. Picking up courage, she touched it with her foot and the hand grasped her toes. Screaming and struggling, she lost her balance and came tumbling through the few remaining branches onto the dead leaves below. With her had fallen a small laughing creature no taller than herself. That frightened you, it said. Arietti stared, breathing quickly. He had a brown face, black eyes, tussled dark hair and was dressed in what she guessed to be a shabby moleskin, worn smooth side out. He seemed so soiled and earth darkened that he matched not only the dead leaves into which they had fallen, but the blackened branches as well. Who are you? she asked. Spiller, he said cheerfully, laying back on his elbows. You're filthy, she remarked. Disgustingly, after a moment, she was still very angry. Maybe, he said. Where do you live? His dark eyes became sly and amused. Here and there, he said, watching her closely. How old are you? I don't know, he said. Are you a boy or a grown-up? I don't know, he said. Don't you ever wash? No, he said. Well said Arietti after an awkward silence, twisting the coarse strands of grayish horsehair about her waist. I'd better be going. To that hole in the bank? He asked, the hint of a jeer in his voice. Arietti looked startled. Do you know it? When he smiled, she noticed, his lips turned steeply upwards at the corners, making his mouth a V. It was the most teasing kind of smile she had ever seen. Haven't you ever seen a moth before? He asked. You were watching last night? Exclaimed Arietti. We're at private? He asked. In a way, it's our home. But he looked bored suddenly, turning his bright gaze away as though searching the more distant grasses. Arietti opened her mouth to speak, but he silenced her with a preemptory gesture his eyes on the field below. Very curious, she watched him raise cautiously to his feet 
and then in a single movement spring to a branch above his head, reach for something out of sight and drop again to the ground. The object she saw was a taut dark bow strung with gut and almost as tall as he was. In the other hand, he held an arrow. Staring into the long grass, he laid the arrow to the bow. The gut twanged and the arrow was gone. There was a faint squeak. You've killed it, cried Arietti distressed. I meant to, he replied and sprang down the bank into the field. He made his way to the tussock of grass and returned a moment later with a dead field mouse swinging from his hand. You got to eat, he explained. Arietti felt deeply shocked. She did not know quite why. At home under the kitchen, they had always eaten meat, but borrowed meat from the kitchen upstairs. She had seen it raw, but she had never seen it killed. We're vegetarians, she said primly. He took no notice. This was just a word to Spiller, one of those noises which people made with their mouths. Do you want some meat? He asked casually. You can have a leg. I wouldn't touch it, cried Arietti indignantly. She rose to her feet, brushing down her skirt. Poor thing, she said, referring to the field mouse. And I think you're horrid, she said, referring to him. Who isn't? remarked Spiller, and reached above his head for his quiver. Let me look, begged Arietti, turning back suddenly, curious. He passed it to her. It was made, she saw, of a glove finger, the thickish leather of a country glove. The arrows were dry pine needles tipped with black thorn. How do you stick the thorns to the shaft? she asked. Wild plum gum, replied Spiller. Are they poisoned? Asked Arietti. No, said Spiller. Fair's fair. Hit or miss. They got to eat. I got to eat. And I kill them quicker than an owl does. Nor I don't eat so many. It was quite a long speech for Spiller. He slung his quiver over his shoulder and turned away. I'm going, he said. Arietti scrambled quickly down the bank. So am I, she told him. They walked along the dry ditch together. Spiller, she noticed, as he walked, glanced sharply about him. The bright black eyes were never still. Sometimes at a slight rustle in the grass or hedge, he would become motionless. There would be no tensing of muscles. He would just cease to move. On such occasions, Arietti realized he exactly matched his background. Once he dived into a clump of dead bracken and came out again with a struggling insect. Here you are, he said, and Arietti, staring, saw some kind of angry beetle. What is it? she asked. A cricket. They're nice. Take it. To eat? asked Arietti aghast. Eat? No. You take it home and keep it. Sing's a treat he added. Arietti hesitated. You carry it, she said, without committing herself. When they came abreast of the alcove, Arietti looked up and saw that Homily, tired of waiting, had dozed off. She was sitting on the sunlit sand and had slumped against the boot. Mother, she called softly from below and Homily woke at once. Here's Spiller. Arietti went on a trifle uncertainly. Here's what? asked Homily without interest. Did you get the horse hair? Arietti glanced sideways at Spiller, saw that he was in one of his stillness and had become invisible. It's my mother, she whispered. Speak to her. Go on. Homily, hearing a whisper, peered down, screwing her eyelids against the setting sun. What, what shall I say? asked Spiller. And then clearing his voice made an effort. I got a cricket, he said. Homily screamed. It took her a moment to add the dun colored patches together into the shapes of a face, eyes, and hands. It was to Homily as though the grass had spoken. Whatever is it? She gasped. Oh my goodness gracious, Arietti, what have you got there? It's a cricket, said Spiller again. 
But it was not to this insect homily referred. It's Spiller, Arietti repeated more loudly, and in an aside she whispered to Spiller, Drop that dead thing and come on up. Spiller not only dropped the dead field mouse, but a fleeting echo of some dim, half-forgotten code must have flicked his memory. And he laid aside his bow as well. Unarmed, he climbed the bank. Humley stared at Spiller rather rudely when he stepped out the sandy platform before the boot. She moved right forward, keeping him at bay. Good afternoon, she said coldly. It was as though she spoke from the threshold. Spiller dropped the cricket and propelled it toward her with his toe. Here you are, he said. Homily screamed again very loudly and angrily as the cricket scuttled, knee-high past her skirts and made for the darker shadow behind the boot. It's a present, mother, Arietti explained indignantly. It's a cricket. It sings. But Homily would not listen. How dare you? How dare you? How dare you, you naughty, dirty, unwashed boy? She was nearly in tears. How could you? You go straight out of my house this minute, Lucky, she went on. That, my husband's not at home, nor my brother, Hendry, neither. Uncle Hendry. Began Arietti, surprised, and if looks could kill, Homley would have struck her dead. Take your beetle. Homley went on to Spiller, and go, and never let me see you here again. As Spiller hesitated, she added in a fury, Do you hear what I say? Spiller threw a swift look toward the rear of the boot, and a somewhat pathetic one toward Arietti. Arietti, you can keep it, he said gruffly, and divide it off down the bank. Oh, mother! exclaimed Arietti reproachfully. She stared at the tea her mother had set out, and even the fact that her mother had filled the half-hips with clover honey milked from the blooms failed to interest her. Poor Spiller. You were rude. Well, who is he? What does he want here? Where did you find him? Forcing his way on respectable people and flinging beetles about. Wouldn't be surprised if we all woke up one day with our throats cut. Did you see that dirt? Ingrained. I wouldn't be surprised if he hadn't left a flea. And she seized the thistle broom and briskly swept the spot where the miserable spiller had placed his unwelcome feet. I never had such an experience as this. Never. Not in all my born days. Now that's the type, she concluded fiercely, who would steal a hat pin. Secretly, Arietti thought so too, but she did not say so, using her tongue instead to lick a little of the honey out of the split rose hip. She also thought, as she savored the sun-warmed sweetness, that Spiller, the huntsman, would make better use of the hat pin than either her mother or father could. She wondered why he wanted the half-nail scissor. Have you had your tea? She asked Homily after a moment. I've eaten a couple of wheat grains, admitted Homily in a mydrid voice. Now I must air the bedding. Arietti smiled, gazing out across the sunlit field. The bedding was a piece of sock. Poor Homily, the practically no housework, had little on which to vent her energy. Well, now she had Spiller, and it had done her good. Her eyes looked brighter and her cheeks pinker. Idly, Arietti watched a small bird picking its way amongst the grasses. No, it was too steady for a bird. Here comes Papa, she said after a moment. They ran down to meet him. Well, cried Homily eagerly. But as they drew closer, she saw by his face that the news he brought was bad. You didn't find it? She asked in a disappointed voice. I found it all right, said Pod. W w what's the matter then? Why do you look so down? You mean they weren't there? You mean they've left? They've left all right, or been eaten. Pod stared unhappily. What can you mean, Pod? stammered Homily. It's full of foxes, he told them ponderously, his eyes still round with shock. Smells awful, he added after a moment. 
Yikes. So the uh, Badger set is no longer a home for them to stay in or for them to go into. Yikes, they might have to make a place that is a boot after all, or at least set something up. And maybe if Homily hadn't uh, screamed and yelled at Spiller so much, they might have been able to find out some more information from him about what had happened as well. Interesting thoughts. Go ahead and leave them down in the uh, comments down below what you guys think. And I wanted to say thank you guys so much for tuning in, being part of this channel, sharing this channel. And you all have a wonderful, wonderful and blessed day.